Well, good afternoon, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Let me make sure we're here that I'm on the right system. I am. That looks good. Okay. All right. Welcome to Java Station, the best brew on the bird, or in the bird, the bread that is easy for me to say. Maybe it's because I've not had enough coffee yet. Excuse me to say. Yes, Java Station, the best brew in the Berg. And we're just waiting on a few more people to show up. And we're going to get started here on the book of the Revelation. Today is going to be pretty much just a little review. Because today I had something very special happen to me today. Welcome, brother. How are you doing? Good, good, good. You? You're doing great. I have to segregate. You have to segregate? <laughs> Sorry, you should have done that before you came to class. This is called a demerit, a write-up. What do you teachers call it? I call it negotiation. Oh, okay. Well, we'll wait. So how's your week good, brother? Crazy. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. But we did get my dad baptized today. That was awesome. That was awesome. Yes, sir. Awesome. What did that oh, I tell you what, it was really, really cool. Okay, once we get everything uploaded on the website, you'll be able to download this little packet. It is our study guide for today, and it's basically a review. We're going to be talking about the seven churches uh, of the book of the Revelation, how they relate, what, what's going on in those seven churches, how they relate to us today. And I'm also going to be answering a question that was asked of us last week that I didn't know the answer to. You know, it's kind of a rare thing that I can ask a question that I don't know the answer to because a lot of times I just made stuff up. I didn't really say anything about it. But no, I was asked a question um, about the size of the New Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, since I've already gone over this with Robin and she's in the restroom, <laughs> we'll go ahead. And uh, turn to the second page in the little pamphlet here. And the new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven. I was asked, how big is that place going to be? I mean, that's going to be coming out of heaven. How big is that place going to be? Well, in Revelation chapter 20 or 21, I don't remember which one it is. It talks about how big it's going to be in furlongs. Well, I don't know how long a furlong is. So I had to do a little study. So... A furlong, when you break all that down, 1,200 furlongs is about 1,500 miles, depending on who you talk to. Some of them, some measure furlongs a little bit different than the other. But I'm going to go ahead and use the 1,500 uh, mile uh, for 1,200 furlongs because that just makes all the numbers work out well. Um, if you look, you'll find out that this is a, a cube. It is a square. So it's 1,500 miles wide, approximately. 1,500 miles high, approximately, and 1,500 miles across, or deep. That's huge. So, that's 1,500 miles times 1,500 miles times 1,500 miles. That's 1,500 miles cube. That's cubic space. How much is that? That's, in miles now, that's 3 billion with a B. 3,375,000,000 miles. How do you work on this thing from here? Yes, sir. Oh, great. Get this on camera so that way when I wake up dead tomorrow, you all have a free spot. Anyway. That's the thing, you wouldn't wake up. That's right, pretty much what it's uh, What is really interesting is when I was looking at the different scales that they showed, they showed the circumference around. The New Jerusalem, even though it's a cube, the circumference will be 8,164 miles. When you look at it across the two corners here, it's 2,600 miles across. This place is huge. We talk about big city life. This is big city life right here. Um, when you look at it right below that, it's about the same size as our moon. Wow, that's huge. Also, uh, it gives us two little reference points. Uh, on the bottom part here, it would actually encompass more than half of the United States. More than half of the 
the United States. How many people is in the United States? Like 300 million? Wow. How big is Jerusalem now? Uh, Jerusalem now is about the size of New Jersey. So it's not very big. So, then also, you look at the last one, and it shows you how tall it would be in reference point to where it is, where it would be on the planet. So again, 1,500 miles straight up. That's a lot of square footage. Okay. Now, let's go back to page one. We're talking about the seven churches of the Revelation. This basically is going to be a review. We're going to talk about these seven churches, about what they are doing good and what they haven't been doing good. Um, the first one is Ephesus. And Ephesus gets a pretty good scorecard because when we're going to look at these, we're going to look at how they're doing. You know, each one of them gets a little bit of a scorecard. So Ephesus lost his first love. So it's not fired up about, you know, following the, the Bible the way they really should, but they have some things going for them. They hate the doctrine of the lawless church, also known as the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Remember, the word Nicolaitan is a very interesting word. The word Nicolaitan is a compound word. It comes from the word Niki and Nico, which is where we get the word Nike, and Laetan, which is where we get the word laity. Nike means conqueror. Laity is the people in the church. Nicolaitans are the conquerors of the people in the church. Well, how do you conquer the people in the church? You get them to do what God says do not do. That's why they are, again, haters of the lawless church. And again, why is this important? Because when the Antichrist raises his ugly head, and he will one day, how are we going to know him from anybody else? How are we going to know the Antichrist from the actual Messiah in his second coming? Because do you know that the Antichrist will have signs and wonders? Wow, that's pretty scary. <clears throat> He's going to have signs and wonders. How are we going to know the difference? Well, the signs and the wonders that the anti-Messiah is going to have are going to be lawless signs and wonders. Now, what's that mean? How does that relate to us? Well, I want you to think about it today. Today, most people in the church, and I'm not belittling anybody. Please don't think I am. I'm not putting anybody down. But I just am trying to get people to think. Most people in the church think, well, you know... Sabbath. Oh, by the way, Shabbat Shalom. Today is Sabbath. You know what? Nothing wrong with doing good on the Sabbath. We are here today to learn about the Word of the Living God. That's what Sabbath is about. It's a holy convocation for you to learn more about the Living God. Again, a time for you to relate to God and relate to your family. So, once again, so a lot of people would say, well, you know, I can do Sabbath any day I want. Sabbath is always Friday evening and sundown to Saturday evening and sundown. Now, am I saying that if you don't do it exactly that way, you're going to hell? No, I'm not. What I am saying is, is that, you know what? That's what the Bible says Sabbath is. And Jesus said he is Lord of the Sabbath. And if you love the Lord your God, Jesus even said, if you love me, you'll keep the commandments. I want to keep the commandments. That's all I'm saying. So, this first church, Ephesus, they lost their first love, but they can be fired back up, you know, that their first love. Uh, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Is all. It means 
all. So you're going to keep all the commandments all of the days of your life. Okay? O Israel. And remember, when we see that, when it says, O Israel, we've got to remember that that's us. That's believing Israel. That's the church today. Those are the ones who love God enough to keep His commandments. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, I've only come for the lost sheep of who? Of the Baptists? Of the Methodists? Of the Pentecostals? No. I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. Okay. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Okay. Now that's the promise. Now here's what I was getting at. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. This is called a Shema statement. Shema in Hebrew doesn't mean just to hear. It means to hear and obey. To listen and do it. So this is called a Shema statement. Hear, O Israel. Once again, that's us. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, some people will say, see, right there. There's only one God, and so that means there can't be a trinity. The Lord our God is one. No, actually, this is actually telling us that the Lord our God is one in essence, but three in person. And that's very important for the table. We'll get to that later. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lay down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the door posts of your house and on your gates. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land in which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities, which you did not build, and houses full of all good things, which you did not fill, and huge cisterns, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship Him and swear by His name. You shall not follow other gods any of the gods of the people who surround you. Okay. Really important here. You shall teach them diligently. Teach what diligently? I mean, we're, we're only in Deuteronomy, so how much of the Bible have we got before that? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So that's the Torah. So you shall teach the Torah diligently. To who? To your kids. To your grandkids. When? Now this is what I really like. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and of course that means to your daughters too. And you shall talk of them. You shall discuss them with them. You will debate them. With them. You'll, you'll discuss them. You'll, you'll go over them. And they may have questions, and you might have to look for the answers. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That's all the time. So we are to be thinking, and you know, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. That's another reference to this right here. To do this all the time. Okay. So, that's what Ephesus had kind of lost out on. They had lost out on their first love. Loving the Lord your God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then we have Smyrna. Smyrna is the masquerading church. Hypocrites attended. Well, let's look at that. Uh, da, 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 da. And to the angel of the assembly of Smyrna, which write these things, say the, the first and the last, I know thy works. Now remember, every single time it says, I know thy works. And tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them that say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Remember, this is one of those times when we have basically some translator bias. So you've got some people in the, in the church that are saying, hey, guess what? We are the Jews. We are the bomb.com Jews. And if you don't do the way we do it, you're not going to heaven. You're not even a real Jew. 
you know what? You can replace that word Jew with Christians too. We are the bomb.com Christians. And if you don't do it exactly the way we do it, you're not really a real Christian. Right? No. It's not how we think about doing it. It's not how a group of people decide to do it. It's not how a society thinks about doing it. It's about how the Bible says to do it. So these people are masquerading. They're hypocrites. They put on a face. They want you to think that they are holier than that one. Actually, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Then we have Pergamum. Satan's dwelling place. Now, who wants to go to church there? <laughs> Satan's dwelling place. And to the angel of the assembly of Pergamum, write these things, say, uh, he which has the sharp sword with two edges. Once again, he talked about the sharp, sharp sword with two edges. That's Balaam. That's Balaam's doctrine. Balaam is the one who had Balaam's donkey. His donkey saw the angel of the Lord in front of him. And three times, Balaam about to just beat the tar out of his donkey. Struck him three times. Donkey's not going to go. Finally, the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus, it's a, a, pre, a, a pre revelation of the Messiah, opens the mouth of the donkey and allows him to speak. Says, wait, wait a minute. When have I ever not done exactly what you asked me to do? And here you beat me these three times. And then all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord opens the eyes of Balaam and he sees the angel of the Lord standing there with a double edged sword. He says, why did you beat the donkey three times? Well, he was trying to go do something he wasn't supposed to do. The angel of the Lord stopped. What did Balaam do? Balaam was hired to curse the nation of Israel. But he's a prophet of Israel. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. But, you know what he did do? He figured out a way around it. He said, oh, you know what? I can't curse him. He blessed them instead. He gave them a blessing. And they grew. But he went to the king that hired him. I can't remember the guy's name at the moment. And he said, you know what? I can't do it. I'm a prophet of Yahweh. I cannot curse Israel because Israel is God's chosen people. But here's what I can do. I can show you how to cause him to fall. I can show you what kind of block to throw in front of him to make him stone. What did he do? He said, get him to marry outside of the Israelites. Get him to marry the women of the foreign lands. Get him to follow their gods. You know, because you know what? And we hear this today. A boy would come home with a young girl to his parents and say, Mom, Dad, guess what? I've got this lovely, pretty girl, and I want to date her, and I want her to be my wife. But wait a minute, she's an atheist. Or wait a minute, she's Buddhist. Or wait a minute, she's Muslim. Oh, that's okay. I'll bring her to church, and I'll change her. How often does that happen? Hardly ever. More than, more than likely than not, the, the man is going to be changed. He's going to follow the woman. And so that's what happened. That's what Balaam did. So, Satan's dwelling place. This is also uh, where syncretism and lawlessness is introduced. Syncretism is, again, what they were doing as part of Balaam's doctrine. They were actually blending two different types of religions, paganism and the laws of God, Christianity, trying to blend them together to come up with a new religion. That's what religion does. That's all religion does. You either have the truth of God's word, or you have syncretism. That's it. So, that's what they were doing. They were engaging in lawlessness. Then we have Thyatira. That's a fun name to say, Thyatira. Thyatira is a church that accepts false prophets and teachings, false prophet teachings and syncretism. What false prophet was in Thyatira? Do you remember? It's a lady. Well, you know, I told you this would be a test. <laughs> Jezebel. Oh, Jezebel. That Jezebel, who who was telling people it was okay to have sex anytime you wanted, any way you wanted, and she was supposedly a prophetess. And telling you all these people that they didn't have to obey the word of God. So yeah, you know, that, that's kind of a false prophet. We have a lot of that going on today too. A lot of churches that to say today, 
uh, well, you know what, uh, the Pope says this, so you know, that's what you're going to do. Or the Imam says this, that would be of the Muslim faith. Or the Dalai Lama says this. These are all, again, false prophets. And so this is, again, teachings of syncretism. Now, in the Islamic faith, they take, they have a Jesus, and they take that Jesus and they try and blend it with Muhammad. Muhammad's the prophet, Jesus is a prophet, so they try and blend those two together. That's what syncretism is. Um, Rick Warren, very famous for the purpose-driven life, he tried to uh, blend, he tried to say that Christianity and Islam were basically the same thing, they just came from different directions. So he called it Chrislam. That's syncretism. That's false gospel. Then we have the church of Sardis. Sardis is the social gospel church. Now we talked a little bit about this the last time. That again, this social gospel church, what do you think about this? We've got a guy. Let's say, let's say I want to go out there right now and I want to burn the American flag. I have every legal right to do that. You know what? And nothing will happen. As long as I don't set anything on fire out there that doesn't belong to me, nothing will happen. No laws against it. But if you go set an LGBTQ flag on fire, gentlemen got 16 years because they consider that hate speech. That, and guess what? It was a church's flag. It was a church's LGBTQ flag. Where you used to go to church and ripped it down and burned it. Now, do I agree with you should have taken it and stolen it and like that? Because that is stealing. But, man, did hate speech for burning and flying? And the church just the one who put it out there. So that's called the social gospel. Doing what? Hey, promoting what's going on in, in uh, the world today. There is no absolute right or wrong. Seeker friendly. There you go. That's a perfect way of putting it. We don't want to offend anybody. So let's not put a cross out on our, on our property anyplace. Hey, some of you might see that cross and might get offended. Uh oh. Wow. You know what? We've talked about this before. If you have a pair of Nikes on and you have that swoosh on the side of your Nike, what's that called? It's called an icon. It's called your your uh, your label. Logo. Your logo. What's our logo as Christians? The cross. So if you're ashamed of the cross, you're ashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter one, verse sixteen. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. So, that's the social gospel. Then we have the church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a really interesting church, because this is the church of the open door. They actually get an A+. Plus. I mean, they're doing things great. The door is wide open. You know, let's run through it. Let's do it. So, they really have no condemnation. But again, in every single circumstance... Jesus says, I know your works. So once again, do works save you? Everybody. No. Do works save you? No. no, they don't. But are your works important? Yes, yes they are. You know, um, there's a place in the scripture where it says, you know, you have somebody come to you and they say, I'm cold and I'm hungry. And you, know, you tell them, hey, go be well fed. Hope to stay warm. Boy, your works have really done a lot of good, haven't they? That's all you can do. Okay. And then you have Laodicea, the sleeping church. This is the church that's dead asleep. They've even got the door bolted from the inside. They're not interested in letting people in. They're, they're comfortable where they are. And the church of Laodicea, I know that works that thou art eaten either. Cold nor hot, I would, I would thou wert cold or hot, so that then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So they're so bad off, they don't even know how bad off they are. And unfortunately, how does that relate to churches today? How many people do you think, do you know, maybe, maybe nobody, but maybe you know you, that come to church 
and they read only the little snippet that the pastor puts up on the screen. And maybe not even that much. They just, oh, John, yeah, I'll okay, get to that later. And they never open their Bible the rest of the week. How many people you know like that? How many people you know that don't even do that? They show up for church and eh, once in a while. Or, like I used to call my mom, priest church. She showed up on Christmas and Easter, and that was it. See, that's the sleeping church. That's a church that doesn't care. They don't care enough to show up. They don't care enough to be awake when it's time. And uh, as mentioned in the Song of Solomon, you know, it says, Knock, and the door will be open. That's Revelation 3.20. Let's look at that. Because this, again, is part of the latency in church. Let's start at 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So stop doing this and repent. 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Stop right there. Most people look at this particular scripture and say, See, that's the gospel. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. No, that's not what that means. That's actually wedding terminology. That's what the bridegroom would do when he was getting ready to make his proposal to his bride. He would come to the bride to the bride's home after the ketubah of the wedding contract and all this all settled, everything's done, we're ready to go. They go home for a couple of days, they come back. He has a ceremonial cup and he has a bag of a, a skin of fresh wine, new wine. And his father's with him. So we have the, the groom and the father of the groom. They come knocking on the door. Then you have the father of the bride and the bride inside the home. Well, this is another place where we get it wrong. Most people say, see, now the father would say, okay, get your stuff together, your, husband, your future husband's here. No. No, the father would look to his daughter and say, daughter, they're here. Do you wish me to open the door to them? And if she wanted to accept this proposal of marriage, she would say yes. Then the door would be open. They would come in, sit down, and have a ceremonial meal of bread and wine. Where have we heard that before? That's communion. And then they would finalize that. And now they are truly betrothed. They are truly betrothed. In order to stop it from this point out, you have to get a full blown divorce. After this, they go out and do a public betrothal, which includes a mikvah or a baptism. That's why when Mary and Joseph were betrothed, but they hadn't come together and consummated their marriage yet. Joseph was going to put her away quietly because he didn't want her to get stoned. They were legally married at that point. That's what this means. So, to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in thy throne ever, even as I also overcame it, I am set down with my father in his throne. Even as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the ascendants. Again, to those churches. That's because the word church didn't even exist until about 1,600 years ago. It was always a symbol. So, that is our basic review of the seven churches. So now we're going to go on to page three since we've kind of gone over the size of the New Jerusalem. That is like you can fall over. And then on this page right here, it's really interesting. It's about the seven. How many sevens there are in the book of the Revelation? There are 55 sevens and five sevens. Five times seven is 35 phrases of sevens in the book of the Revelation. The number five is also very significant. Where we know the number seven is the number of perfection, that's God's number. The number six is the number of man that's in completion. The number five is the number of grace. So... That's also significant. In the symbolism of numbers in, in Scripture, five is the number of grace. Mm -hmm. The Trinity would be three. Yes. <laughs> so here's some of the examples of sevens that we had in the book of the Revelation. There's seven churches. We talked about the seven churches just now. There's seven letters to those seven churches. There's seven spirits, the seven spirits of God. Seven golden lampstands, seven menorahs. Seven stars. In the hands of the Messiah. 
seven seals. Now, this gets really interesting right here. This is also wedding terminology. The seven seals are the seven people who would have to be at the wedding. That's really cool. Because when we get a little bit further into Revelation, it's going to say, and who is worthy of opening up the seven seals? Nobody was worthy enough to even look upon it. Why is that? Because when you finalize the ketubah, a wedding document, and that's what this Bible is. This Bible is our wedding document. It's our responsibility as the bride of Messiah, Israel. And it's his responsibility, what he will do for us. He's going to save us from our sins. So, what would happen would be, you'd have three copies of the ketubah. One copy would be given to the bride's parents. One copy would be given to the couple. And the third copy would be recorded down at the courthouse, just like we do today. Wherever the Sanhedrin would be or the ruling party of the day, it would be recorded there. That way, if something happened and the marriage would arrive, then only somebody of authority can open those seals and see exactly who said what about who's going to have what responsibility. This also would include any penalties that would be included in there, like 50 shekels of silver. We think 50 shekels of silver, what's that, about 50 dimes? Well, in that day and age, that would be like a year and a half's worth of work. That's a lot of money. It also would include the, the bride's inventory. When the bride comes into the, the marriage, the father gives her lots of stuff. You know, and he gets what's called a dowry in return. So the bride's inventory would be included in this. So, why is there seven seals? Because it's the number of people who sign the ketubah. You have the father of the groom and the groom. Then you have the father of the bride and the bride. You have the two witnesses, and then you have the rabbi who actually officiated the ceremony. That's your seven people. And when they would actually sign the ketubah, they would actually have a signet ring, and they would stamp it with a seal. That's why those wax seals had to be broken off. Who is who's worthy enough to loosen the seal? Only a person with ultimate authority could do that. Only Jesus could do that. So that's pretty cool. We'll see. You have seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets. I love the trumpets. You have these different trumpets of different things happen at the different trumpets. But I want us to remember the final trumpet call. And then we're going to get to this. This is Yom Turah, the day of trumpets. The final trumpet call is when Christ will return. It's when the Messiah will return to collect his church. That's Yom Terah. There's seven thunders. There's 7,000 people. There's seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven golden bowls, seven hills, seven kings, and in last, seven visions. A lot of sevens. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's beginning to sound like a very Jewish book to me. Oh, yeah, it's because it is. Jesus is a Hebrew. He would be from the tribe of Judah. In Hebrew, that would be Yehuda or Yehudi, depending on who you talk to. He was a Jew. So that's why this symbolism is very Jewish. Well, as we look down below that, you see on the right-hand side a menorah. This is what the menorah would look like. You have your seven candle lampstand. Now, at Hanukkah, they have a different lampstand. It has nine. Yeah, that's a little different. That's called a Hanukkah. But this is called the menorah. This is what they would light in the, in the Holy of Holies. This is what God told them to create as part of the accoutrements for the inside of His holy temple. So, when you look there... It has seven different lamps, seven different candles. Each one of those candles represents a festival of the Lord. And each one of these is listed in Leviticus 23. The first one is called Pesach. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Pesach is Passover. Uh, Hag Hamatha, I can't pronounce that. That is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yom Kippurim is the uh, uh, first fruits. Then you have uh, Shavuot, which is Pentecost. That's 50 days after Passover. That's what Penta means. Penta, like Pentagon, means five-sided building. But Pentecost means 50, 50 days. Then you have the next one, Yom Turah, 
trumpets, rapture. This is the rapture of the church. Yom Kippur, Jesus returns. This is the holiest day of the year. This is the day of atonement, when you would have natural, natural atonement for all of Israel. And then you have Sukkot, where Jesus reigns for a thousand years. Or this is also known as um, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, on the other side over there, you'll see each one of these uh, fulfilled in Revelation. Passover is a future application of the Lamb's blood in Revelation 1, uh, 5 and 6, 5, 9 to 10, that type of thing. Unleavened bread, you'll see that. First fruits, weeks, or Pentecost. Feast of Trumpets, the Feast Day of Atonement. Now, this is where I don't agree with this. Uh, and again, so is your interpretation. But I've read it a couple times in a couple different ways. What I agree is that the Day of Atonement is a fast day, not a feast day. Uh, almost all your celebrations are hard to say. They're called Moedim, or, or uh, Holy Convocations, which are feasts. Like today, Sabbath is a feast day. So you're supposed to already have everything already prepared. You don't have to worry about working. Boom, you just eat whenever you're ready to eat. But it's the way I read it, and again, I could be wrong, but the way I read it, the Day of Atonement is a fast day. And then after that is a feast day. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, this is very important. Because this is when Jesus came to tabernacle amongst us. This is why we know that December 25th <laughs> is not the birthday of the Messiah. But, he was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacle in 3 B.C. People say, well, we don't know the date of Jesus' birth. Actually, we do. It's September 26th. 3 B.C. And we can actually calculate that. Pretty interesting. Okay. So now we're going to move on. So that's our review and that's our seven. So now we're going to kind of talk a little bit about something different. Today was a very interesting day for me. I got to baptize my dad. And I was so blessed with that. And, you know, baptism is all about being submerged under water symbolizing death, rising up out of that water, symbolizing a new life and a new man coming into a new walk. So, if you look here on the very back page, it says, Christ sacrificed once for all. It's Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Once again, your works cannot save you. This is where the Jewish people get it wrong. They think, hey, okay, feast of Tabernacle, check mark. Feast of Young, four, check mark. Ten Commandments, check mark. Think they can do it, and that saves them. It doesn't work that way. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. This is why this is so important for us to remember, especially when we're sharing the gospel, is that we have all sinned. Everybody does it. Everybody has done it. But we don't have a high priest that doesn't relate to us. These, the sacrifice that Christ did once for all, <coughs> this, this sacrifice that Christ did once for all uh, is to remind us that we owe a debt, that we couldn't pay on our own, that we were penniless and powerless to do anything about it, but He did it. He did it perfectly. Now, some people are going to say, well, he did it perfectly, so now I don't have to do it. I don't have to do that. Because Jesus did it. No, it's not right either. Because Ephesians chapter 2 says we were created unto good works. Okay, if we're created unto good works, who created us? 
God did. Who decides what good works are? God does. So, we have something we have to do. And let's figure out what it is. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Blessed is the man. Blessed. Now, who wants to be blessed here? I did. I'm going to be blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law. Okay, let's stop right there. Whenever you see that word law, that's Torah. That literally is translated from the word Torah, which means instruction. But his delight is in the Torah of the Lord. And whenever you see Lord in all caps like that, that is literally the Tetragrammaton. That's yo he va pe Yahweh. So, but his delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah, or Yahweh. And on his Torah, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, how much is all? All. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Why won't they stand in the judgment? Because they're going to be on their knees. They're going to be on their face because they know they're going to get judged. They will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know what? Do we truly believe this? Think about it. If we truly believe this, we would be telling everybody we know. Everybody would get a chance to sit and talk to you. And I know you tell me that I do this all the time. I talk to people in the Walmart parking lot, checkout line, wherever I happen to be. You know, I love to talk to people. That's just who I am. I don't know it's like that. But every time you get a chance to talk to somebody, figure out a way and ask, hey, are you right with God? Do you know Jesus? More importantly, does Jesus know you? Because if we truly believed these words, that the way the wicked will perish, we do something about it. You know, if I went by your house, and I saw your house is on fire, I'm going by and I was like, oh, guess what? Guess what? house is on fire. Maybe I'll be texting you. <laughs> uh, guess what? house is on fire. I'll have to figure it out. No. No, if I care, I'm pulling up into your front yard. I'm beating on your door, and if I have to, I'm kicking the door in to come and get you. Because we care. That's the way, if we truly believe this, that's the way we should have it. Psalm 19, verse 7 through 11. The law of the Lord, the Torah of Yahweh, is perfect. Do perfect things ever change? No, they never do. Once you reach a state of perfection, you will never change. God never changes. Why? Because it's perfect. Now, can he change his mind? Can our prayers affect God's outcomes? Yes, it can. But that doesn't change who he is. He himself is perfect. Perfect things never change. God's law is perfect and it never changed. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. I love to stop right here. Because think about this. If simple people would simply read their Bible, they would get wise. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Wow. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now, wait a minute. Why is it so clean here? You ever thought about that? Most people will say, oh, we don't need to worry about clean and unclean anymore. But all through the scripture, it still talks about that. It still talks about clean and unclean. We need to think about that. 
enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. You know what? Our works and our obeying the commandments do not save us. But we get rewarded for this. We get rewarded for keeping the commandments. You know, it talks about, and we'll get a little bit further into Revelation, about how that we are um, we are refined by the fire. And as we are refined by that fire, we are precious metal, precious stones. And we are gold and silver refined by that fire. You know, gold and silver, fire might remold it, might change its shape. It's not going to destroy it. It's not going to affect the precious stone, sapphire, <coughs> fire, nothing. Fire is not going to affect it. But if you're building everything that you're building, if everything that you're doing is wood, hay, and stubble, what's the fire going to do to that? Gone. So our works do not save us. But our works are a basis for our reward. Psalm 119, verses 105 through 106. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Wow. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. A lamp to my feet and a light into my path. I mean, that right there, you could do a whole sermon on that. But God is light. Jesus is that light. He is the living Torah. And as such, as the light of the world, we should follow him. And then, of course, one of my favorite verses is Psalm 119, verse 160. The sum of your word is truth, and all of your righteous rulings Endure forever. Endure for a little while. Endure for a season. Endure forever. So when God puts a rule in place, it's never going anywhere. Um, and the reason this is important, especially for us as Christians to remember, especially for us as talking to somebody who doesn't believe, Let's say you're talking to an atheist. There is no God. I don't need to worry about your silly made-up God. Wait a minute. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Atheist. Where do natural laws come from? Like laws of gravity, magnetism, thermodynamics, physics, logic. Did I say mathematics? Mathematics. Okay. Where do those come from? And why do they not change over time? I'll tell you why. Because they come from my God that you don't believe in. <coughs> because His righteous rules endure forever. You see, we have to understand God's Word is perfect. And if we truly believe it, then we are going to evangelize. You know, I know some of Satan, and I know you evangelize in your own way, you evangelize in your own way, I evangelize in a crazy way. I'm just I'm whacking you out there, street preacher guy. But you know what? We all have to evangelize in some way. Whether it's getting to know people and making them cards and telling them you love them and that Jesus loves them through those cards and through those little things that you do that are so sweet. Or being on the radio or on the phone with somebody and telling them, hey, you know, guys, the way you're talking. Jesus. Don't you want to know Jesus? You know what? We all have our own congregation. You have people that you're going to run into I'm never going to see. You have people that you're going to run into I'm never going to see. I have people that I'm going to run into that you all are going to see. You know what? By doing these things like this online, I have people that I'm talking to right now that I'm never going to see. But hopefully they get the message. And no matter what, no matter who you are or where you are, you have your own congregation. 
you have a responsibility to this gospel. Because Jesus said to take the good news of the gospel to all creatures of all nations and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Wait a minute. Did you get that last part? Teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. Now, I always like to thought, too, why did he say, take the good news of the gospel to all creatures of all nations? Do you ever think about that? That always used to be, what? Do I have to take it to orangutans over in Africa? Do I have to take it to the dogs here in the corner in Tuffer? No. You know what? Sometimes we look at people as less than human. That is just unfortunately who we are as a species. As hard as we all try and not do it, sometimes we do. There's some people that I look down on, I look down my nose at, and say, Ugh, I'm not talking to you. Ah, I'm not talking to you. But you know what? Jesus said, no. You tell the gospel to everybody, no matter who they are, no matter what you think of them. Take the good news of the gospel to every creature, even if you don't think they're human. Jonah. He didn't think the people over Nineveh, the Ninevites, he didn't think they were human. He goes, no, God, not them. Anybody but them. I'll go the opposite direction. I'm not taking the gospel of them. God said, I don't think so, boy. But you know what? God used Jonah and his desire to disobey to actually give us one of the most quoted prophecies of Scripture, the Jonah Code. That just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. <coughs> so God can use us, even in our rebellion, to bring the gospel. If we're willing. Jonah ultimately was willing. He was ultimately hiding because he was in the belly of the, uh, belly of the ship. Trying to sleep. How do you sleep through a massive storm like that? We try to do that. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm one of those kind of guys that whenever something bad happens, I'll go hide in bed. I'm guilty of it. I won't admit it. I'm a witness right here. You know? So that's what Jonah was doing. He was hiding. He was trying to sleep his way through. God says, no boy. <laughs> Get up. You see... People would say, well, well, God didn't let Jonah exercise his free will. Yeah, actually, he did. To a point. You see, we all have free will to choose to obey or not. But you don't have ultimate free will. I have the free will if I want to to jump out this window. But I don't have the free will to say what will happen when I get the <laughs> You know what? We have free will. Do we believe this gospel? Do we, we believe that people are actually going to perish? Do we believe that people are going to end up in a place called hell where there's going to be eternal fire? Or is it just a lovely book that we like to socialize around once a week? It's a tough question. But that's a question only you guys can answer. And only you can answer too. So, on that note, does anybody have any questions? All right. One of the things I'm going to go ahead and point out real quick, <coughs> just because I have a couple extra minutes, and it is in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And this is about free will. Chapter 30, verse 15. Choose life. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. See, once again, does it save you? But it will bless you. 
And you know what he even said before that in verse 11, chapter 30, verse 11? Because he's already told them, let's, let's go back a little bit further. Uh, verse 7. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies. He's talking about all these different things uh, that he's going to put on the enemies and hate Israel. Uh, I will inflict all these curses on your enemies, those who hate you, who persecute you. And you shall again obey the Lord. See, what they've done is they've run away. They've hidden. They've not obeyed. And God's talking about how he's going to restore Israel. You will once again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. How many? All. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand and in your offspring of your body in the offspring of your cattle and in the produce of your ground. The Lord again will rejoice over you for good just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the law, the Torah, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now people say, but it's too hard. I can't do that. There's all these commandments. I can't do that. Uh-oh. The very next verse says in verse 11, chapter 30, verse 11, for this commandment which I command you today is what? Too difficult? <clears throat> no. It says not too difficult for you, nor is it out of your reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven and get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. Now the question is, do you choose to? Once again, the very next verse in 15 says, Choose life. See, I put before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. Life and prosperity if you obey, death and adversity if you don't. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Okay, since I can't answer, ask one of the answers in so. <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to holler at me. You can send me an email at jimmysmrbatman.com. All my contact information is on mrbatman.com as well. My phone number, 502-354-8699. Um, we're here every Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, next week, we will be going back into a deep dive study of the book of the Revelation. Now we're going to start talking about, we, the first three chapters have been about the menorah. Now we're going to start talking about the Holy of Holies. The, the, the tabernacle itself, the Holy of Holies, is going to be a really great study about seraphim and cherubim and the difference between the two. So, hope you can join us. Um, and on that note, we will close in prayer. Father God, Abba, Father, we thank you. Lord, today has been an awesome day. I have been so blessed in so many ways. Uh, Lord, uh, I know that Satan is attacking in so many ways because he knows that, you're part, that, that there's work going on. And he's trying to distract us from what is important. But Father, your work, let it be at the forefront of our eyes. Let it be at the forefront of our desires. Father, let us not be distracted by the adversary and his plans. Father, we love you. We praise you. We, uh, Father, we pray for those who couldn't be here with us today. And Lord, we uh, look forward to the time again next week when we can study your word and have a great fellowship once again. It's in Yeshua, Jesus' holy name that we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 All right. Thank you all for joining. Y'all have a great day. God bless.